Hello, and welcome to the North Coast Journal Preview, where we take a look at the stories being followed in the upcoming edition of the North Coast Journal. My name is Dave Frank, and I'm joined by North Coast Journal's news editor, Thad Greenson, and arts and features editor, Jennifer Famico Cahill. Welcome, guys. Hello. Hey. Hi, David. Let's dive right into it. And uh, what are you guys covering on the, uh, what's the cover story this week for the North Coast Journal? Yeah, this week we have um, a cover story by a new staff writer at the journal, Ashley Harrell. Um, this is her first cover. And um, it is about is a, a rare kind of silver lining um, pandemic edition of the journal about how um, COVID has led uh, the local fishing fleet to kind of um, change the way it does business. And now they are doing a lot of direct sales from docks in the Woodley Island Marina. Um, and so the story kind of details how, um, you know, historically um, the fishing fleet in Humboldt County um, has brought in, you know, tremendous amounts of catch, millions and millions of pounds and multiple species of, uh, of seafood, but very little of it stays local. Uh, most of it comes into one of two major processing plants that, um, and, you know, a, a fishing vessel will kind of pull up to the dock and unload its entire catch. They will clean it and freeze it and put it on ice and ship it out of the area. And in some cases, ship it partway across the world um, to other markets. And so while we have this kind of wonderfully robust um, local commercial fishing industry, it's actually, you know, a bit of a challenge to get local fish in some restaurants. And it's a bit of a challenge to get local fish in the restaurant and in uh, local grocery stores. But not anymore. Now, um, uh, fishing boats, you know, because supply chains were... Um, were so devastated by um, by uh, COVID, with restaurants closing and um, some shipping routes closed and things like that. Uh, the fishing fleet really had to reevaluate how it did business. So, is it a coordinated uh, fishermen like uh, committee of some kind that discusses this, discusses this, or did they all sort of have to navigate this on their own? They all uh, they all have to navigate it on their own. Um, and uh, but the the president of the Fishermen's Marketing Association locally, um, Harrison Ebach, um, was kind of one of the first to make the switch. And he said that he'd long been kind of interested in, in selling from the docks, but it's a lot more labor intensive. Um, it's it's kind of a different level of regulation than just um, wholesaling to uh, to producers. And so he, that always kind of made him leery. Like the, the good thing about selling to a producer is you come in from like five days out at sea and you dump your whole catch and then you go home and you rest. Whereas if you're doing it yourself, you come in from five days at sea, you clean a whole bunch of fish, you get ready for two days of like direct sales and dealing with customers and all that stuff. Um, and then you also have to, you know, get special permits and stuff. So he was always kind of leery of it. But then, you know, when COVID hit, um, it was kind of that or dry dock his boat and go on unemployment or something. And so he decided, you know, this is worth trying and uh, paid 150 bucks, I think, for a permit and bought a scale for $400 and some plastic bags and totes and stuff and um, went to Facebook to do some DIY marketing and uh and yeah, made the plunge. And he's, he said that he, he hopes he doesn't have to go back to wholesaling. He's, he's really enjoying selling direct. I mean, it's really something when you think about someone who has decided to spend their life at sea probably didn't do it because they love retail. <laughs> but, exactly. you know, some people are, are able to, you know, shift and and move into a totally different market. And the thing that I personally love about this story, which Ashley did a great job on, is that it features um, Wendy Chan, our frequent journal contributor. It just happened to be that Ashley went down there and she's fairly new to the area. She went down to the dock. And if you go down to the dock looking to buy the fish, you're gonna see Wendy Chan. She's just there. I think she bought like a hundred pounds of fish that day. She's she's a person who I just, she just actually um, delivered or I picked up some food from her and she was on her way to get her chickens done. She's getting pork from this person. She's sending fish to that person. She's like, she's like a, I don't know, some sort of a hub of bartering. And um, anyway, so, but she's there and, and she's in the story, which I kind of love. And what a great person to guide you through buying fish at the dock. So not to cut to the, to the, uh, you know, the headline here, but um, have they been relatively successful and well received in the community? Very. Yeah. Um, you know, Harrison told Ashley that uh, they basically every day they they're selling out and they're having lines down the dock and into the parking lot. And 
And he's saying that it's it's absolutely penciling out for them. Um, so something that he'd been very leery to do before, um, he's he's fully making the plunge. And he said, yeah, when once everything kind of goes back to normal, I'm hoping that we can still do this. Um, and it'll be interesting to see, you know, as as things return to kind of a, or move into a post COVID era, if um, if the market is still there, you know, if um, if local people still want to go wait in line at the docks to pick up their seafood. Um, you know, and this is kind of coming as part of a, um, I think COVID has really forced people to um, look hard at their local food systems and sustainability issues and stuff like that. And that's why we're seeing, you know, CSAs selling out and a bunch of interest in the farmer's market and um, and a lot of micro gardens or COVID, COVID victory gardens going in and things like that. And um, hopefully, you know, people realize kind of the value in, in supporting the local fishing fleet and buying fresher fish direct from the docks and, and this will keep going. I'm interested to see if this translates into restaurants locally carrying more local fish, too, as um, it wasn't a matter of, you know, lack of desire. It just wasn't there wasn't a system in place that made it easy, that made it um, affordable. And I don't know, maybe there will be. Mm -hmm. Well, this is great. I want to go check it out myself here. I haven't done that yet. So this is really this is inspiring. Yeah, there's a number of, um, I think 14 boats are selling direct right now, and there's a number of Facebook pages set up if you if you search around for, you know, fish in Woodley Island Marina, a number of them will come up um, and uh, tell you the catch of the day and what's available. Including crab. Oh my God, get the crab. Yeah. yeah. We're due, right? It's so good. <laughs> All right, well, cool. Thank you, guys. Um, Jennifer, what's the news from the Arts and Features beat this week? Listen, all we are talking about is seafood. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> The seafood edition of the North Coast Journal. <laughs> yeah, there are no meaty stories. There is only seafood. Um, so Oyster Fest happened last weekend. Did anybody know? Did anybody hear about it? No? We did it at home <laughs> at my house, but we you didn't did? do it remotely. No, yeah, we didn't participate for some reason. I'm not sure why, but um, we did have oysters, and they were wonderful. So you Local. just had them in the silence of your home without a bunch of drunks, without right, right. people playing music, without a jam band. You did it? Okay. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. I guess you could. Um, <laughs> how how would how should we have done it? How did it go down this week, last weekend? Well, I'm not going to say how anybody should have done it, but I will say that Oyster Fest made the leap in a way that you know so far, I haven't seen any any place nationally where food festivals have made a successful go at a social distanced festival. Whether they're trying to make it a physically um, distant but all in one location event or it just has not been working out um so seeing arcada main street launch this virtual fest was really fascinating because you you're basically watching an experiment and hopefully other festival organizers are watching this experiment too to see what's up um so arcada main street decided that what they were going to do for their mission this time was not about necessarily fundraising not about because it's their biggest fundraiser of the year and previously when they've had issues with getting um, really cheap prices on beer even to the point of excluding local beer from the plaza and just having that um, exclusive deal with uh, seaquake last year um, that was all cost cutting because like every other business they've been hit hard in this economy and so they were trying to make as much money as they can at their one big fundraiser for the year. However, this year, because all the businesses have been so devastated by COVID, they decided our mission is going to be to get some cash, um, get a cash injection into these local producers, particularly oyster producers, beverage producers. Um, they just wanted to try and make some money. So what they did was they made these DIY kits, which I've written about before, um, that were oysters, some sort of local brew, um, beer, cider, wine, and swag, like an oyster shucker and a steel cup, et cetera. You could buy those for somewhere between 140 and 160 bucks. Ouch, it's yeah. It's steep. It's steep. But, Maybe that's why um, we didn't do it. <laughs> my, but the streaming was free. So at 10 a.m., instead of stumbling all the way from, as I put in the piece, I always end up parking out at the creamery because I end up coming later than I should. Instead of stumbling down the street to get to the plaza, you just had to like log on. You just roll out of bed, log on, and there was a virtual fest. So that was kind of like an all-day, almost like an all-day talk show hosted by Shoshana, she of Redwood Rocks. 
uh, belly dancing, oh, right. fairy fest, um, perpetually sparkling person. I have literally seen her in a supermarket and I was like, Shoshana? And she turned and twirled and I swear glitter flew off of her. It was, <laughs> it was amazing. That's how she rolls. Um, yeah. <laughs> We're in the deli counter and she's like, zing. So anyway, she was there, she was hosting it and it was very much watching somebody, you know, tap dance all day. I don't know if you've experienced this with your Zoom calls for office time, but when you are talking to a screen and there is no one coming back at you, just sort of like, and the same thing with the musicians who are playing for an empty jam that was closed and that they were streaming from, it takes a lot of effort. So I have to, I have to give much applause to the musicians, totally. and the performers who took part in the whole day, because that was seven hours seven hours of events. Some of it was pre-recorded. There were a lot of interviews with local oyster farmers, including Sebastian Elright, who is in the fish story. So it's all about Sebastian this week. Um, including, you know, small fishermen, um, coast seafoods, the big one, you know. Um, there were also videos of chefs talking about, you know, the, the oyster that they had prepared for that day. I think three out of four of them showed you how to shuck an oyster finally, safely. Um, so the next time, you know, you That's see so someone easy. struggling, you can just jump in. Um, there were the oyster contestants for best raw, best cooked, most creative, etc. And those were, there were only six entries this year in total, oh, six no. restaurants participating. But you know what? It's locked down, man. Yeah. Um, they did what the they could do. Yeah, and those entries have been dwindling anyway for several years, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. For one thing, it's really expensive to participate in Oyster Fest and expensive to participate in the contest. You're out there just trying to make some kind of a slim margin by being on the plaza and paying, I think it was about 500 bucks for a booth uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so you're out there trying to make a profit on top of the booth rental, on top of the all day overtime for your staff, on top of the cost of ingredients and everything else, sweating in the sun, trying to do all this. And then you've got to give some 15 oysters away for free to the judges and they have to be perfect. They have to show up hot or cold, whichever. It's a lot. So those numbers have been dwindling over the years. Um, I am impressed that they were able to get six entrants during a pandemic. Um, and then there was a really great uh, talk by Ted Hernandez, who is the WIAT um, chair, uh, tribal chair. And he talked about the place of Humboldt Bay in WIAT culture and WIAT history. And cool. he talked not only about Tulawat and kind of canoeing across the bay in dugouts uh, to, for ceremony, but also about how he referred to at one point the bay as Costco for native people. He said, oh. it was our supermarket, that was everything. We just went and gathered there. Um, there was some talk by one of the fishermen earlier who said that Native people had been since forever, since who knows how long, moving oysters around to better locations in order to basically farm them in the bay. Um, but he talked about the importance of, you know, gathering food before going to ceremony, how every part of the bay is connected to WIA culture and the world renewal ceremony and how important the world renewal ceremony is. And he even talked about the things that are sort of plaguing our society today, everything from actual plagues to racism. And he was saying, you know, we haven't done these ceremonies and, you know, without that, you know, without that constant renewal, he talked about it being connected to suffering in the world. And so it was really, it was really interesting to watch that. And I, I think as much as we might miss the out in the sun all day, getting a burn while you listen to a jam band, I think there was something to the educational part of it. It was a little awkward at times. It was a little bit slow. It was meant to be, I think, in the background while you have your own oyster party at home, not to be glued to it, taking notes like the freak that I am. But <laughs> It was really something, and I think it was instructive, because I don't know that I want to go back to just a bacchanalia, just like I don't want to necessarily go back to thoughtlessly enjoying restaurants and not thinking about the people who are working in them. Um, and after COVID, I don't know if we can. And so I think this was a very good exercise for us. It was a good fundraiser for 
for businesses, I hope. I haven't gotten any word back from Arcata Main Street. But my other hope, besides the financial bonus, would be that we all come away from it with a better appreciation of who is bringing us these oysters and, um, you know, the, the environment that we need to take care of in order to have them and enjoy them. Well, that's really great. I'm glad they were able to make it work. It sounds like it was a success um, we'll f to be determined on the finances, but uh, this is an advancement in what we can expect for next time around. This is fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and thank you, Thad. That's just about going to do it for this week. North Coast Journal is on newsstands now. Pick up a copy or check them out online uh, while social distancing. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks again, guys. Take care and see you next week. See you next week. Thank <laughs> you.